After Alex Albon's relatively average 2020 Formula 1 season with Rebel Racing, the managing directors at the team decided enough was enough, again, and sacked him to put Sergio Perez in the car instead alongside Helmut Marko's secret crush Max Verstappen. I'll add that in the first four races of 2021, Perez has been further off the pace of Max than Alex was on his debut with Rebel in 2019, but I don't want to start a war so we'll forget about that. Anyway, Lord High Marko kicked Albon from Rebel and decided that rookie Yuki Tsunoda should take Viet's Alpha Tauri seat instead which has so far resulted in one points finish and a whole lot of complaining with it. Red Bull have instead decided to keep Albon as their reserve driver, but they've sent him to race in DTM primarily instead alongside Red Bull Junior team member Liam Lawson and Nick Cassidy. Now depending how much of a motorsport fan you are, you may be familiar with DTM and you may not. So today we're going to look through the history of the series before a preview to the new 2021 season of Germany's primary racing championship, Deutsche Tourenwagen Masters. The series began all the way back in 1972, when the new Deutsche Rennsport Meisterschaft Championship was formed, translating as an imaginative German racing championship, but known as DRM. The cars to be used would be Group 2 touring cars and Group 4 GT cars racing solely around German tracks, so cars such as BMW 2002s and BMW E9s would be used. It was the new sister series of the German Circuit Racing Saloon Car Championship, of which I'm honestly not going to try and pronounce the real name, since as you can probably tell from my accent, I'm quite British, but it seems to be quite exciting in West Germany where it was running. Races on the weekend would run separately depending on engine size, with the Division 1 races being for 2 to 4 litre engine cars and under 2 litres in the Division 2 race. So just that bit confusing. It lasted like this up until 1977, when the immensely quick Group 5 touring cars came in instead to replace. Group 5 cars of which some of them had more power than F1 cars back in the day, so there were some serious toys knocking about. Not a huge amount noticeable happened other than some not very well known drivers racing up until 1982 when the rules changed again. This time the cars would change to the Group C sports cars category, and this is where the DRM began to start a slow death. There just weren't very many manufacturers interested, and in 1985 the series eventually died. Just 13 years after it was founded, it was folded. It wasn't particularly spectacular in its time, but that wasn't the end. Alongside the DRM in 1984, the new Deutsche Tourenwagen Meisterschaft was founded, aka DTM. This was a new German touring car championship and what would replace DRM as the premier racing German series. So in 1984, the first German touring car race was held with privateer teams running Group A cars, which were touring cars. But over the years, the Group A regulations would change along with these cars. Some good and some bad changes, such as the banning of turbochargers in the cars in 1990 due to costs. Financial struggles ending up being something DTM would have pain with up until this day. Works teams started joining DTM in the late 1980s, and it was looking like a much bigger series than DRM ever grew to be, and was becoming one of the fans' favourite European racing championships. However, in 1993, due to cost reasons and overall evolution of the championship, the Group A cars would then be abandoned, and replaced with the new FIA Class 1 touring cars. Cars which featured ABS, four-wheel drive, carbon fibre chassis. They were dream cars. However, if you thought that was a chance for the series to actually last a while, you'd be wrong. You see, DTM wanted to expand drastically, even more from 1995, and the plan was to merge DTM with the FIA International Touring Car Series. The teams of DTM would compete in both the International Touring Car Series and, of course, the Deutsche Tourenwagen Meisterschaft. However, due to the price of travelling to international events at tracks like Brazil and Suzuka, teams struggled financially, as well as the organisers. And in order to continue, the organisers then upped the price of viewing on TV, which as you'd expect then meant people stopped watching it. And people also didn't want to go to the tracks anymore since they were raising admission prices, and the attendance for fans at races dropped and dropped. Finally, constructed teams like Alfa Romeo didn't like the fact that they were racing in countries where the cars weren't actually sold. So due to all of these issues, manufacturers began leaving the championship. And with Mercedes being left as the only constructor on the grid, after the 1996 season, DTM was officially cancelled. But in 2000, it returned. After what a quick summary would describe as car manufacturers and the FIA arguing with each other for a few years, eventually everyone came to an agreement meaning that the DTM could return in the year 2000, with Mercedes, Opel and Audi Abt being the manufacturers you could drive for, and the races mainly being in Germany but a handful in the rest of Europe like the 1995 layout was. However, when they came to round one in Hockenheim this year, it wasn't all happy days. 
First of all, there were a substantial amount of cars which didn't have a single sponsor on them. And while the Mercedes and Opel cars are pretty much level on pace, the Abt cars were way slower. And if you were driving an Abt, unless you were Lewis Hamilton racing Ryuji Kamita, you had no chance of an actual result. Since to put it nicely, the car had the aerodynamics of a donkey. However, as I attempt to interpret this poorly written article I'm reading, apparently the Abt was so embarrassingly bad and since a third of the grid raced one, the rulemakers let Audi Abt change parts of their car to try and bring them up to the pace of the rest of the grid. I bet Claire Williams would be jealous. And this resulted in the 2002 championship actually being won by an Abt car, with Laurent Aiello dragging what can only be described as a Tata Nano to P1 in the standings. After supporting Ab from 2000 until they left the championship in 2004, Audi then decided to join the group for themselves, replacing them for 2004, where they were immediately successful, bringing in Matthias Ekstrom who won the driver's title on debut, which is relatively impressive for a company with no experience in the series. However, in 2005, DTM started dying again, when longtime entrant Opel decided to pull out of the championship and initially the gap was supposed to be filled by MG Rover, as you can see, a very German car company, but they then went bust, leaving DTM with just Audi and Mercedes as the entries. And you may be asking, well what's the problem with that? Well the problem with that is that the German TV broadcaster ARD who streamed the races had an agreement that there had to be at least three manufacturers on the grid in order to keep streaming the races. And with Opel leaving, this then meant the ARD deal fell through, killing a lot of the already struggling publicity of the series going into the later 2000s. From 2007 up until 2014, not a huge amount of drama happened like we'd seen so far. But to summarise, DTM signed a deal with the Japanese Super GT Championship to begin holding shared races from time to time, which is a bit like Le Mans. And there were also plans to create an American DTM series, but they fell through. Well, there's something weird about that. I love how it was planned to be called American DTM, because if you remove the abbreviations, that series is going to be called what translates as the American German Touring Car Championship, which is just that bit confusing. In 2012, BMW joined the series, bumping it back up to three manufacturers, and a drag reduction system in the rear wing like an F1 was also introduced in 2013 to try and increase racing. However, in 2014, they changed the cars for one final time until 2020, where they completely redesigned to what were known as Class 1 Touring Cars, and at this time they also restructured the weekend format, bringing in two races a weekend and a new 20 minute qualifying session for the drivers. However, with three different cars on the grid and a total number of 24 drivers, it's odd how it never really seemed to take off. Like the championship looked great, plenty of cars, cool cars as well, racing on decent tracks in Germany and other spots in Europe, but it never really gained a huge amount of traction and never became a big series. However, this was because it was dying another one of its slow deaths, this time because Mercedes left the grid eventually. And to be fair, based on the history, it never seemed like it was going to last until 2020 like this, so it's kind of amazing that the championship did. But since the series was once again getting no publicity and teams were struggling financially, another manufacturer left the series after 2020. So after current Formula E driver Rene Rast won the title in 2020, for 2021 they've had to opt for huge changes to keep the series alive. But before I move on to 2021, and 2020 is an attempt for more publicity, they sort of tried to add new publicity in a different way. That being them launching a DTM feeder series, DTM Trophy, of which I thought you should try and get DTM itself a bit bigger first, but that's my opinion. DTM Trophy would be GT4 cars racing on select weekends of DTM, but it hasn't exactly taken off yet. Sure there are plenty of drivers, but until I looked into DTM further this year I didn't know about this championship, and a substantial amount of drivers don't have Wikipedia pages. But one final thing before I go into the 2021 guide for the big boys and real DTM, a basic summary. It was a championship racing all sorts of different cars from 1972 to 1986. From 1986 to 1995 it raced slightly different touring cars and grew quite big, but then due to a number of complications while trying to merge with an international series, it meant that it had to fold. In 2000, DTM returned with full-blown touring cars. However, over the years, up until 2020, the organisers struggled with publicity and getting manufacturers and drivers to race. So after 2020, to keep the series alive, Deutsche Tourenwagen Masters is going all new. The main new feature for this year is how it's no longer touring cars. 
As you'll have seen from the thumbnail, that was the Ferrari 488 GT3, because DTM is becoming a GT3 championship. They're also racing in a lot more locations this year, starting off the season at Monza, before heading to Lausitzring in Germany, Zolder, Nürburgring, the Red Bull Ring, Assen, Hockenheim Ring, and the Norris Ring, so it looks quite exciting. I won't lie, I think the Red Bull entering DTM has certainly brought publicity, along with the GT3 move. Since before then, I didn't really know too much about the series, and now I'm considering watching it from round 1 in June. And I'm sure there are plenty of other fans in the same situation as me. As for my predictions, I don't know a lot about a whole lot of drivers, but based on results from the two 2021 tests so far at Lausitz and Hockenheim, Maximilian Gotts seems to be pretty quick, but we won't know who's fastest until round 1 of course. Albon and Lawson seem pretty quick as well, I reckon they'll be top 7 probably, and Sophia Flush. Well what were you expecting me to say? Now finally with the future of DTM, I'm not sure how long DTM will stay GT3, mainly because the organisers are looking to turn the series fully electric soon. I never thought I'd say this, but I'll try and leave a link at the end to a vlog why Sophia Flush tests an electric DTM concept car. But for the next couple of years at least, it'll probably stay GT3, and it'll also probably stay as the new place of rebel to dump the F1 drivers they were in the careers of. Wonder who's next? If you enjoyed this video, which has been certainly different from normal ones, make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't already. But with that, I'm Daniel, have a nice day.